Step 7. Dikes. So first of all, I make another new layer. I put it above the base map um, so that you can see it clearly. Um, and then select its colour. You can do that with all of them. And then I untoggle all of the irrelevant information, or layers rather. And I use this curvature tool to draw my dikes. Um, as you know, like nothing in geology is straight, so I like to use the curvature tool rather than the um, pen tool uh, to draw my dikes because quite often they do, although linear features, they do vary slightly in their orientation. So um, I then fill it with a green, I make it a thicker line, and then I select it, I copy it, and then I paste it again. I want this pasted line to be a boundary of this dike. So I toggle boundaries and then I reselect them. I then use the eyedrop tool and get the same dashed line as I have for all my other boundaries. Now I no longer have, need to have the boundaries. So then I align that with the edge of this dike and you can see it fits very, very well. Again, I copy that, that new line and paste it. And then align it with the other side. So dikes are also the same, where if you've seen an observed boundary, you should have it solid, and dashed line is inferred. So I do that again. I start off using the pen tool, then realise it's looking a bit um, too straight. So I go and undo what I've done in this case just to try and make it a bit more curved. Okay, so now that's done need to adjust that. I then reselect the uh, eyedrop tool and then make the line the same colour as the green. And then I've got a nice green line, same thickness as the previous one. Uh, okay, I repeat that then. Um, I then take copy that line and then paste it. Using the eyedrop tool, I then copy the boundary of the previous line, uh, die, and then I align it again. And again, it fits quite nicely. So although it looks like it fits the centre here, I do always like to check the ends just in case it's slightly off. So there you go, copy and then I paste it again. And again you can see it looks like it's more or less aligned but it's way off at the end so I need to drag it into the place. And see now it fits much better. Okay, and for the smaller uh, dike itself, it's actually quite straight, so I could always use a line tool for this. Um, and I just do the same process again, getting the three lines, one being green and the other two being dashed. If you wanted to put like solid lines um, that, that were observed boundaries, you just do the same process I mean, you could um, make the whole line uh, solid if you observe the whole boundary, but likewise, you could always do the kind of making inc incisions with the um, path eraser tool to select the areas that you want to say that are were um, observed. Okay, so I'm just going through and doing all these dikes. Okay, so now that's all my dikes done. I'm now just going to show you. You may have more, you may have less, you may have none. Um, but you can see that's them all. That's all my layers, building up, and all my data. Again, locking things so that I don't accidentally move anything.
Okay, just to show you what I keep saying, um, keep saying about putting your base map um, below your data. If I put this base map above all my data, you can see that it's actually really foggy and you can see the striking dips aren't clear, neither are the dikes, neither are the faults or the boundaries. So that's why it's really good to put them above your base map, but keep your lithologies below so you can still see the base map, so your block lithology colours that is. And then it just works so much better. You can really see that everything's very clear and visible. Okay. Okay, and then ensuring that I save my work so I don't lose anything. Okay, so some of you may have uh, cone sheets such as those that map mapped on Ardenmerken or other uh, IGNEA centres. So for instance, I had them on RUM. So I'll just show you how I quickly did them. Did them very similarly to um, dikes. However, because they have such a, a, a dip on them, um, I wanted to indicate that as well. So again, for all my cone sheets, what I did, I kept them as a standard, standardised size um, just to make it easier um, and clearer on my map. So again, using the eyedropper tool, I then put them, put the whole copy and paste thing off the line, eyedropper tool again to get the boundary line, and put that there, and then copy and paste that, and then align them both with the edges. And then because I have a, a, a dip angle on this, um, you can see I've, I've, I've indicated that by like this, this three-pronged side to show the angle at which it dips. So, using the line tool, I then make these um, lines. And then see this one I make a little bit too short, so I'm going to elongate that so it looks better with the other one. And then again, just like what I did with strike and dip, I put the data on. And then I did exactly the same with um, what I did with strike and dip in the fact that I grouped that. And then I then do the copy and paste thing again. and. Um, changing the orientation on the of the um, cone sheet as to which orientation I wish it to be and then amending the number. So you'll see here on this one over here I paste it and in this case I didn't copy over the number but the font's still standardized because it's what I just used so then I just type in What's right. Okay, so that's how I did cone sheets. 